It was Christmas Eve of 1940, and despite the horrors of war, across Germany, people were enjoying the festive season. Sadly, Elizabeth Bungenar wouldn't live to see it. Her body was found on railroad tracks in Berlin after she'd been hit over the head and thrown from a train. But she was not the first victim and would not be the last. In a string of brutal murders that shocked the nation, and that the Nazis wanted to keep quiet. To understand more about these horrific events and when they began, we need to go back to 1939, just before the start of the Second World War. Please note this episode contains adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the first episode of Prasher's Murder Map. Today we're going to travel back in time to Nazi Germany, just before the beginning of World War II, and board the fast city train known as the S-Bahn. Thanks to the blackout, the nights were darker than ever, and inside the train there was only a glimmer of light to stop you stumbling. It was through this darkness that a remorseless serial killer crept, so on our journey remember to keep your eyes wide open and don't trust everyone who wears a uniform. In 1939, warring events had been occurring in the garden area adjacent to the train tracks in Berlin near Rummelsburg S-Bahn station. There were rows of allotments for people to grow fruit and vegetables, keep a shed and store gardening equipment if they didn't have any land attached to their own home. About 8,000 people lived in and around this suburb area, including a number of railroad employees, as it was conveniently close to the train station, and many people would walk through the gardens to reach it to travel to work. It was pleasant and green, full of cherry trees, chestnut trees, bushes and grasses, but thanks to the recent blackout imposed by the government, you couldn't see much of it after the sun went down as all the streetlights were turned out to make it harder for British planes to drop bombs. Only the moon lit the way for pedestrians, but people were permitted to shine a flashlight on the ground very quickly to prevent them tripping, but then had to turn it off again straight away. Several reports were heard of a man scaring women by shining a flashlight or his bicycle light in their faces at night. By shining a light so high, He was violating the blackout and risked a hefty fine if he was caught. Penalties for crime during the wartime blackout were much harsher than usual. For example, someone stealing coal might get themselves executed. Some people wore round badges coated in phosphorus, which glowed faintly in the dark and allowed them to see others approaching. But it wouldn't have offered much light, so the victims were terrified when a figure suddenly emerged from the blackness and shone a light in their eyes. It would have been very disorientating after being in the dark for a long time, and they were temporarily blinded. Some women then reported that the mysterious figure had shouted abuse and threats at them, and soon the assailant got bolder, and enjoying the power and control he had over his victims, escalated to grabbing them or hitting them. Nobody knew who he was, but he was described as below average height and stocky, with receding black hair, thin lips, prominent ears, and one nostril larger than the other, maybe due to a fight. Although the events worried women walking through the area, the attacks had so far not been serious enough to cause any major injury, that is, until August the 13th. Around 1am, Lena Wudzinski, a factory worker in her early 40s, 
was walking home through the garden area. She shivered in the darkness, chilled by the night air, even though it was summer. She couldn't stop her mind drifting to the story she'd heard about a man jumping out and attacking people in the middle of the night. She gasped as she heard footsteps behind her. She quickened her pace towards home, heart pounding as the footsteps matched her speed. She quickly shut her garden gate behind her and ran towards her front door, but a heavyset man followed her in, hit her over the head and knocked her to the ground. She was concussed, still conscious, but unable to call for help, as the assailant stabbed her in the back four times. Throughout the bloody frenzy, he didn't utter a single word. Fortunately, she was able to drag herself into the house to safety and reach the phone. With hospital treatment, she was lucky to survive, but couldn't give the police a description other than the man's approximate height. After the attempt on Lena Wudzinski's life, there were further reports of harassment and flashing lights into women's faces in the garden area. It was possible the attacker had been scared off by his failure to kill Lena and returned to his more familiar M.O. for a while. Unfortunately, it didn't take him long to pick up his knife again and embark on a journey from which there was no return. On December 14th at 1.15am, 19-year-old Herfa Jablinski was walking home after work through the garden area. At this time of night, the area was deserted. She heard footsteps behind her and started to hurry, remembering the stories she read in the newspaper. She started to run, but her pursuer broke into a run too. Panting and terrified, she considered knocking on the door of one of the houses, but realised that everyone would be asleep, so she continued running towards her home as fast as she could. Her pursuer caught up and stabbed her in the neck in deathly silence, not saying a word. She screamed and he ran away, worrying about being caught. Herfa had a wound stitched at the hospital and survived. The attacker had now made two serious attempts on women's lives. Once again, things went quiet, proving that the attacker was clever and was able to adapt and control his urges if he had to. He was worried that Herfa might have had a good look at him and was unsure how much the police knew. But he continued stalking the garden area at night, shouting at people and scaring them with his flashlight. He didn't strike again so violently for another eight months. On July 27, 1940, 25-year-old Gertrude Niesvant was on her way home to her parents' house. The mystery attacker had learnt from his previous attempts that breaking into a run too soon would spook his victim and they were more likely to get away, so he followed her at a normal pace and caught up with her just as she reached the porch of her parents' home. This was the first time he was heard to speak. Are you going in here? Of course. Leave or else I will yell. Shh. Don't say a word. He then hit her over the head and stabbed her in the neck with a pocket knife. Thankfully he missed the artery and she managed to cry out. Panicking that her family or neighbours would hear, the attacker ran away and Gertrude became the third survivor of the vicious assaults. Three weeks later, Julie Schumacher became the fourth. At 11pm near Rummelsburg S-Bahn station, someone flashed a torch in her face. The attacker was evolving, learning that he had to subdue his victims more quickly before they had a chance to scream, so he hit her over the head with a lead cable hidden in his jacket sleeve. She collapsed unconscious and was sexually assaulted. So by August 1940, there had now been four attempted murders and at least another 20 cases of less violent attacks or harassment in the garden area although there could have been more of these, as some victims might not have thought it serious enough to report. After this, the attacker realised that the S-Bahn station and the train itself might be a better hunting ground. In an empty compartment, 
his victim screams would never be heard and they wouldn't be able to get away from him. It was dark on wartime Germany's trains. They only had a pair of incandescent bulbs every six feet, suspended from two rails running along the carriage roof. When the blackout was in force, it was darker still, as only one bulb in each pair was lit, giving the effect of a zigzag pattern of lights. People could just about see inside the train, but not very well. The outside of trains were painted with phosphorus for safety reasons, so travellers waiting on the platform could see it arriving. On September 20th, 1940, Gerda Cargol had fallen asleep on the S-Bahn train after a long day. She woke up to find she had missed her stop, so she got off at the next station, Ransdorf, and waited for a train going back the other way. She was worried in case this invalidated her ticket and she'd have to pay a fine. When the train came, she gratefully boarded the third class compartment and was approached by a man in a railroad uniform who asked her if she was alright. She explained the situation and he suggested she ride with him in the second class carriage. Although in fact the man didn't have anything to do with ticketing, his uniform inspired trust and Gerda assumed he would back up her story if an inspector checked her ticket. Little did she know, the official looking railroad worker would turn out to be a violent killer. At that time only long distance trains had first class seating, and S-Bahn commuter trains had just had second and third class. The second class compartments had far fewer passengers than third class, which explains why the attacker chose to move his victim there. He kept a close eye on the doors, noticing how many people boarded the train at each station so he could plan when to strike, knowing that the time between each station was only 3 to 5 minutes. Just after 11.30pm, as the train was pulling out of Valhida station, he made his move. Before Gerda realised what was happening, he had his hands around her throat. Luckily for her, He didn't realise how hard it was to strangle someone, as you need at least 11 pounds of pressure against a carotid artery for 10 seconds to render the victim unconscious. If pressure is released immediately, the person will regain consciousness, and only after 50 seconds of continued oxygen deprivation will they be likely to die. When she fell unconscious, he believed he'd killed her. He needed to get rid of the body before the next stop. So he opened the doors and with the thrill of the wind whipping around him as the train sped along, he hurled her out into the night, throwing her purse after her. He didn't steal any of her belongings. He shut the door before the train arrived at the next stop, Karlshorst. It had been the most exciting experience he'd ever had, the rush of power over someone's life and death. Miraculously, Despite being thrown out at around 40 to 50 miles an hour, Gerda survived. She landed on a soft pile of sand by the side of the track, but spent weeks in hospital and suffered from chronic headaches as a result of her injuries. Unfortunately, police didn't take her story seriously, assuming it was a simple accident and that she'd fallen off the train while drunk. In some months, almost 30 people died from blackout-related accidents, on Berlin's train tracks due to the pitch darkness, so they thought this was just one more example. Just two weeks later, on the 4th of October, the mystery predator succeeded in killing for the first time. Gertrude Ditter was 20 years old and lived near the garden allotment area where the attacker prowled. He met her at Rummelsburg S-Bahn station, struck up conversation and asked if he could visit her sometime. She had no idea that the charming man she had just met was a cold-blooded killer. When he visited her home, he strangled her and severed her carotid artery, leaving her to bleed out before calmly leaving through the front door and making his escape. Coincidentally, the day Gertrude was killed was the same day the government was going to take her two young children away as she was accused of bad parenting, and it was a civil servant called Herr Brown who was due to visit her that day who discovered the body. 
Because of this, it was suggested that she had committed suicide, but police soon realised that nobody could strangle themselves and then stab themselves in the neck. Now there had been an actual homicide, the case was handed to the criminal police, known as the Creepo. Police Commissioner Wilhelm Karl Ludke was the head of the Berlin unit, and I was interested to learn that he was liberal-leaning, not a member of the Nazi party, and was tolerant of ethnic minorities. He had been given this role as the Nazis didn't want Ludke investigating political crimes due to his outspoken beliefs and the Creepo did not deal with those cases. No fingerprints or murder weapons were found, and there were no defensive wounds on the body, so the police surmised that Gertrude must have known her attacker, and unsuspectingly invited him into her home. They questioned her neighbours and her husband, who had an alibi, and the Creepo identified almost 40 suspects, and offered a reward of 1,000 marks for anyone who could help solve the case. They didn't get anywhere. They saw that all the harassment and assaults in the garden area were linked, but at this point they thought the attack of Gerda Cargol on the S-Bahn was unrelated due to the different MO. The reward posters described the suspect as between 30 and 40 years of age, 1.65 to 1.7 metres tall, mostly wearing blue visor caps or sports caps, a short jacket, long dark pants, and often with a bicycle. 30-year-old Elizabeth Bendorf became the next victim. On November the 4th, she was waiting at Friedrich Schagen station after her shift as a ticket saleswoman. Because of men being sent to fight in the war, women were increasingly working in jobs like these. The mystery man tried his second-class compartment trick again, gesturing to Elizabeth to board that section instead of third. Because of his uniform, she believed he was an official and saw it as a welcome upgrade to a carriage with softer, upholstered seating rather than uncomfortable wooden benches. The man sat opposite her, making small talk to put her at ease, showing that he was able to charm people and lull them into a false sense of security. Shortly after passing Hirschgarten Station, he retrieved the lead cable from his jacket sleeve and hit Elizabeth over the head several times. She wasn't knocked unconscious immediately and tried to struggle, so he hit and kicked her again, then threw her out of the moving train. She survived but was hospitalised with concussion, and it was eight days before she was well enough to speak to the police. Unfortunately, she couldn't remember much about her attacker. It was clear that the two S-Bahn attacks were linked, and police now knew that the man wore a railroad uniform. No fingerprints were found in the carriage, but they did find the weapon, which was a 2 inches thick, 20 inches long piece of lead encased phone cable, with numbers printed on one side. Police cleverly traced the serial number to the manufacturer, and found that this cable had been laid alongside parts of the railroad track about a year ago. For someone to have got hold of it, they must have been a telephone worker or cable layer, or maybe a railroad employee, who found it stored in a warehouse. This sounds like a perfect clue, until you realise that the railroad employed thousands of people. Even so, they were able to eliminate a number of suspects with this new information. The killer continued to evolve, having learnt that the lead cable wasn't enough to guarantee his victims' deaths. The next time he struck, he used a 15-inch long iron bar and didn't warm up by engaging 26-year-old nurse Elfrida Franca in any conversation, simply hitting her over the head without forewarning. She died instantly. With the rush of his success, he opened the train door to feel the exhilaration of the wind and hear the rhythmic clickety-clack of the train and threw out Elfrida's body. She was his second kill, but the first on the S-Bahn train. Confidence boosted by his success, he wasn't ready to go home yet. Less than 30 minutes later, he found another victim. Ermgard Frieser, just 19 years old, was hit on the head with an iron bar, 
causing brain damage. She was found barely alive in the early hours of the morning and rushed to hospital, where she died of her injuries. Now, this reminds me of the Jack the Ripper double event, where two women, Liz Stride and Catherine Eddowes, were killed on the same night. Very little information was being released to the public about the case, as Joseph Goebbels, Minister of Propaganda, did not want the news getting out, as he didn't want people to know that something like this could happen under the Nazi government. Trust in the state was vital to their regime. Wilhelm Ludke, head of the Kripo, was ordered to keep the serial killer on the S-Bahn out of the newspapers, but this just made the murderer even more audacious, believing that they knew nothing about him and it was only a simple, small-scale investigation. Pathologist Dr. Weimann examined Ermgard Frieser's body and discussed the case with Commissioner Ludke. At first they wondered if there were two killers instead of just one, as there were some differences in weapons used and one woman had been sexually assaulted, but the other victims had not. They knew that the S-Bahn victims were connected, but they still didn't realise that the same killer was responsible for the death of Gertrude Ditter, as she had been murdered at a home in the garden area. Nazi racism at the time meant that police didn't want to believe the killer could be an Aryan, but they had to admit that it couldn't be a Jew, as there was an 8pm curfew in place, and there were far too many restrictions for them to move around unnoticed. Weimann and Ludke tried to work out more about the killer and his motivations. At this time, eugenics was a respected science, and they believed that he must have suffered from a mental health issue, or a brain injury. They also suggested he had a bad temper and violent streak, hurting people at the slightest provocation. Ludke also proved his skills as a detective by pioneering an early form of geo-profiling, as he studied a map of the area and marked with symbols where each attack had occurred. This led to an important breakthrough. Ever since the attacks on the train had started, the attacks in the garden area had stopped. They now knew it was the same person who had escalated and took advantage of his growing boldness to kill victims whenever and wherever the opportunity arose. Thanks to the map, they now knew that the S-Bahn hunting ground was between Rummelsburg and Friedrichshagen station. To catch the killer, police officers were posted at all eight stations along the line, wearing railroad uniforms as disguises. Female police officers were also used as a trap to lure the murderer. Funnily enough, this reminds me of Jack the Ripper again, as they also tried a similar method to tempt the killer out, although in those days, the male officers dressed up as women. A policewoman would board a train with a male officer in plain clothes, who would keep an eye on things from third class while she sat in second. It nearly worked. One policewoman saw a suspicious man advancing towards her, looking as though he was planning to attack, but at the last minute he stopped, almost as if he intuitively sensed something was wrong. He had heard rumours from fellow railroad employees about the police tactics and probably suspected what was going on. Or maybe it was what they call killer instinct, as murderers often have the ability to profile their victims, just as detectives profile killers. Terrified that more officers would be waiting at the next station to catch him, he took drastic action. Instead of throwing a victim out of the train, he opened up the carriage door and threw himself out. Unfortunately for everyone else, he landed safely without breaking his neck. The policewoman reported that he had been of average height and wore a hat and black jacket that looked like a uniform, but the poor lighting prevented her noticing any other details. After this, male police actually started dressing up as women, just like in the Jack the Ripper case. They rode the train around midnight, but the killer adapted. As a railroad employee, he must have heard about it through his job, so he started attacking women in the early hours of the morning instead. The body of Elizabeth Bungenar was found on Christmas Eve by railroad workers. 
She'd been hit over the head and thrown from the train onto the tracks. At first, police thought it might be suicide, as there was a note in her handbag classing her as psychologically unfit for work. But her bag had been found about a thousand feet further on from her body, so they soon realised it would have been impossible. It was chilling that the killer's MO had so cleverly evolved to avoid the police night shift decoys. He never seemed to take any souvenirs from the victims or revisit his crime scenes. But at least police now knew that he knew about their movements, confirming that he must have somehow been getting inside information, confirming their suspicions that he was indeed a railroad employee. Just five days later, Gertrude Sievert, age 46, was found on the tracks close to death, having been attacked with an iron bar and did not survive. She was the fifth victim who had been attacked and thrown from the train, and this was the second time the killer had struck on a Sunday morning. The following Sunday, it was five months pregnant Hedvig A. Bauer who met an untimely end. For some reason the iron bar wasn't used this time, but she was punched, kicked and strangled before being thrown off the train, succumbing to a head injury from the fall and dying in hospital. Commissioner Lutka wanted more information to be put out in the press in case anyone could help identify the killer. Goebbels allowed some basic details to be printed with a brief description, but was reluctant to have it covered extensively in the media. Because of the embarrassment it could cause, a violent murderer was on the loose, and the authorities apparently couldn't do anything about it. A decree was passed which called for Nazi party members to volunteer to accompany lone women on the train at night time. Ironically, it would turn out the killer himself volunteered for this program. Eventually the creepo would discover that he was a trusted member of the SA or brown shirts, violent Nazi thugs who did Hitler's bidding. Of course, he couldn't attack the women he accompanied, as he would be found out too easily, but inserting himself into the case in this way meant he learnt even more details about the investigation, allowing him to stay one step ahead. Pregnant Joanna Voigt was next to die on the S-Bahn, and the pressure on Commissioner Ludka was mounting. As Sunday appeared to be one of the killer's prime times to strike, he gathered as much manpower as he could, about a hundred policemen, to round up and question any passengers along all eight stations on the route on a Sunday morning. They did this for two weeks in a row, but didn't find anyone suspicious. The reward was increased to 13,000 marks, and Ludka persuaded his superiors to agree to more information being published in the newspaper. With no further progress made, Ludka formed a clever plan. On July the 1st, 1941, he publicly announced from that day police would cease monitoring of trains in the area. The ploy was believable, as Germany had recently broken the non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, so with war on two fronts, resources would be needed elsewhere. The killer fell for it and grew bolder, killing Frieda Kortziel and carelessly leaving the iron bar near the tracks. Police took plaster moulds of footprints found near Frieda's body and discovered they were a specialised shoe with thick rubber soles made by the manufacturer Salamander, but despite this, they were no closer to finding the criminal. When the cripo interviewed a railway worker and asked if he was suspicious of any of his co-workers, they finally got the hint they needed. The man didn't know his colleague's name, but said he was known to jump over the fence and disappear from his duties. Once he had asked where the man was going, and the reply had been that he was going to see a woman. Although he didn't know his name, the worker was able to point out which building he worked in, Signal Tower VNK at S-Bahn Rummelsburg Station. From this vital clue, it was easy to find out who he was. His name was Paul Agortsov. Now, I've actually checked the pronunciation of the surname and I found the correct pronunciation is Ogortsov, although some um, documentaries pronounce it Ogazal. Um, I spoke to a German who clarified this, so 
we'll be pronouncing it as a normal German-speaking person would do. He had a minor criminal record for burglary, but had been exonerated when the Nazis came to power, as Hitler had pardoned all Nazi party members of any previous crime. Agortsov was a brown shirt and a loyal party member, and although he seemed like a normal family man, the facts were suspicious. Working alone in the signal tower, he had plenty of opportunity to commit the crimes, as nobody could vouch for him, and he'd been known to ditch work for hours and reappear later. He couldn't account for every single occasion he'd gone missing. On the same day that the UK and the Soviet Union signed a pact to fight together against Germany, Detective George Hauser picked up Ogortsov for questioning. He wasn't sure if there would be enough evidence. His build matched the descriptions of the killer, but there were no other obvious features that would identify him. Some blood was found on a pair of trousers in his home, but there wasn't enough to determine blood type. His story was that his wife had been ill and bleeding, which she confirmed. Cleverly, police asked her about this before confronting Ogortsov while he was in custody, so they wouldn't have had time to agree a story beforehand. Would they be able to find enough evidence to convict him? Without advanced forensics or DNA at their disposal, the creepo had to be resourceful. Two surviving victims of the garden area attacks were asked to identify him, although it wasn't done as part of a lineup, as they stood or gorts of in the garden area and pointed him out, asking, Is that the man that attacked you? This could be seen as leading, especially without any other people to compare him to. One victim said she was certain it was him, but the other couldn't be sure. Even so, Ogortsov started to worry, although he tried to act unconcerned. He admitted to the harassment in the garden area, confessing to the lesser offences to give himself more credibility. The creepo asked him to show them his each spot where the assaults were committed. This was a strategic move by the police which paid off. It lulled Ogortsov into believing he would get away with the minor charges only, and that they didn't think he was really a murderer. Unfortunately for him, because he had carried out so many attacks, he couldn't remember exactly which place was which, and he accidentally showed police two places where he had committed the more serious attempted murders, along with the spots of four other minor crimes. Even more worried now, back at the police station, Gortsov asked to speak to the head of the unit, Commissioner Ludka, hoping he would look favourably on him because of his status in the Nazi party and membership of the SA. Ludka wasn't fooled. He set up an eerie scene in the interrogation room, turning out the lights and allowing just a gleam from the desk lamp to shine dramatically onto the skulls of five of the victims, hoping to rattle Gortsov into a confession. It worked. Ogortsov begged for Ludka's help, still believing his status could save him. Ludka convinced him that they already had enough information to prosecute, and the only way he could help himself was by revealing the truth about his crimes. But Ogortsov was a clever killer, and had more than once shown the ability to adapt and think on his feet. He had no choice but to confess to the crimes, but tried to throw a spanner in the works by lying about the murder weapon he used, knowing that this might invalidate his confession in court if it didn't fit the facts. I killed them with my bare hands. He was an incredibly organised killer, able to adapt to the changing situation as we saw earlier, when he either toned down the attacks and reverted away from the trains back to the garden area when he felt under threat, and even changed the times of his murders to avoid the police decoys on the train. Ludka persevered and contradicted him, accusing him of lying. Eventually, Ogortsov broke down and confessed to everything. He was shaking with fear and admitted that he had returned to the scene of the first murder to look at the body, but rather than being excited to see his work, as most serial killers are, he was sickened and after that time no longer returned to look at the victim's remains. On July the 18th, it was officially announced that the s killer had been caught. So what do we know about Ogortsov? He was born in 1912 as Paul Saga, but we don't know anything about his childhood 
or if he ever showed any signs of the McDonald triad of fire starting, bedwetting and animal cruelty, which might have indicated he was likely to become a killer. He was adopted aged 12 by Johann Ogortsov and his first job was as a farm labourer before moving to Berlin and working for the railroad company. Paul Ogortsov was one of the early members of the Nazi party, joining before Hitler's rise to power in 1933, so he had a good reputation and high status as those who joined early were considered true believers. As a senior squad leader in the SA, he did Hitler's bidding and would have happily beaten up Jews or other political rivals, so he would have quickly become desensitised to violence. Luckily for him, he wasn't of a high enough rank to be at risk on the night of the Long Knives, when Hitler purged and disposed of many of the leaders. Ogortsov lived at Dorothea Strasse 24, or number 24 in the garden area, giving him ample opportunity to commit the murders. When he first joined the railway company in 1934, he was a temporary worker laying tracks, and this had turned into a permanent job as a signalman at Rummelsburg station. His job also included handling forts on the lines, getting rid of ice or snow in winter, and replacing gas cylinders in the signals. As a perk of the job, he not only had a free pass for train travel, but was also able to hear all the news about the case being discussed by his fellow workers, including the rumour that police were travelling as decoys to lure out the killer. He was in a unique position to learn about any progress on the case, especially when he joined the group of volunteers strapperoning women at night. The VNK signal tower that he worked in alone was an unattractive red brick two-storey building just a few feet away from the train tracks. In an era of no mobile phones or GPS tracking, there was no way his colleagues would have known when, where and for how long he was abandoning his post. As most of the attacks took place while he was at work, he avoided suspicion until police discovered he'd been disappearing with no alibi. Unlike some serial killers, Paul Ogortsov was not a loner and appeared to have a normal family life with his wife of three years, a son and daughter. He was a keen gardener and spent time growing fruit and vegetables in the allotment and playing with his children, so nobody would have thought he could be living a dual life. The route he took to and from work was exactly where women had been harassed by a man wearing a railroad uniform and he also had a bicycle and admitted to having a dynamo light which he used to scare people. He was an organised and clever killer who was able to adapt and control his urges when he had to. When the police stepped up their investigations, he scaled back and showed more caution, becoming bolder again when they falsely announced they were stopping surveillance. To escape the death penalty, Ogortsov claimed he'd had head injuries earlier in his life, which gave him a compulsion to kill, and he begged to be taken to an asylum to treat his headaches and blackouts. True to his Nazi party ideals, he even blamed a Jew, saying that he'd been treated by a Jewish doctor whose medicine worsened his condition and left him with no control of his faculties. But Agorza was found physically and mentally fit, and despite his pleas of being a family man and not having intended to kill the victims, only to attack them, he was indicted for eight counts of murder and six attempted murders. He didn't have long to contemplate his fate. Unlike in the American justice system where prisoners sit on death row for years or even decades, in the German system there were no appeals. He was executed at 6am on July 26, 1941, just three days after his indictment and less than two weeks since his arrest. He was killed by beheading with the guillotine and, gruesomely, a bill was sent to his wife afterwards, demanding payment for the wear and tear on the guillotine blade. Sometime later, Goebbels and SS leader Himmler had a series of short detective stories created based on the Ogortsov case to give a good impression of the police and restore the public's faith. Half a million copies were printed and sold out rapidly. After the Berlin Wall was brought down in 1989, the S-Bahn expanded rapidly and served passengers from East and West Berlin. 
Today it carries around 500 million passengers every year and links with the U-Bahn, the underground or subway system. In 1998, the VNK signal tower that Agortz have worked in was decommissioned, then destroyed in 2015 to make way for a new bridge. Although the tower has been demolished, the memory of the horrific murders he committed cannot be so easily removed. Millions of Germans died during the Second World War, but the murder victims should be remembered equally alongside those killed in the conflict. The effect on the victims' loved ones has echoed on through the years and passed into their family history as a grotesque and tragic event which they will never forget. And anyone travelling alone late at night on a Berlin train even now must have felt a moment of spine-chilling fear when they see a man in a railroad uniform approaching and remember the story of the S-Bahn killer. You've been listening to the Prasher's Murder Map podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. You can follow me on Twitter at Prasher's Murder Map, visit Prashersmurdermap.com, or email me comments to Prashersmurdermap at gmail.com. I'd love to hear your opinions on this episode. Next episode, we'll be taking a trip to England to visit a confectioner. Sound sweet? Well, don't be fooled. This one is sure to give you more than tooth decay. So until then, take it easy, everyone.